Hi, this is Dr. Richard Benton. And this is Father Mark Bulos of the Bible as Literature podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider a small donation by pledging as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 a month. Your gift will help us improve production quality and will go a long way to contribute to the work of the Ephesus School. Please visit patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Bible to offer your support. Thank you. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton, and this is the eighth episode of The Bible is Literature. Today we talked about Ezekiel 16 and how we taught it to the different classes at Ephesus School. And what we found, surprisingly, is that children of all ages responded very positively to the story of Ezekiel chapter 16. So this episode we just talk about some of the themes that we went over in class. We touch on materialism, we touch on functionality, and so Ezekiel 16 was really a positive positive experience overall in teaching it to the kids. One thing I should note, throughout the podcast, I referred to the youngest class, which was my class this week, as the toddlers. Actually, to be more specific, it refers to children ages four through seven, which was the makeup of the class. When reading Ezekiel 16 to this age group, we followed the narrative verse by verse, but were careful to omit any explicit content. Okay, so this was an interesting week. I think when we both went to check which chapter of Ezekiel we were discussing with our different classes in the Ephesus school, and we saw Ezekiel chapter 16, right. there was a moment of pause. <laughs> right. <laughs> because it's a topic that is, in some ways, challenging for adults, just because it's very graphic. But when you talk about young adults, like teenagers, or even the youngest class, no matter how enthusiastic you are about being serious about sticking to uh-huh. the content of Scripture, Ezekiel chapter 16 is uh, it's a bit right. uh, <laughs> it's a bit out there in terms of our sensibilities. Right. So with the sexuality and the violence in there, it really is kind of shocking to someone who has pious sensibilities. Which makes it all the more surprising and encouraging that it seems like the classes went really well. I heard the young adults laughing and being very engaged in your class. Right. So talk about how that went. Right. So the kids in my class that day were between 8 and 13. And the only snicker I got was the time where it says that your breasts had formed and your hair had sprouted and you were ready for love. When they heard breasts that got a couple of Snickers. That gets Snickers from adults, That gets Snickers from everybody. Yeah. So, And I said, what does this mean? And I kept saying it so they would get over their Snickers. And then I said, it means that she's gone through puberty, and so it's an appropriate time for her to get married. She's old enough to get married. So that's all I talked about with that. But, you know, the whole notion of taking what your parents give to you, your parents give you money, and they give you time so you can go and do things that are good for you, and you try to buy off popular kids at school and make them friends with you and stuff like that. Using what your parents have in order to be popular, even among people who are questionable, as one of my daughters says, sketchers, even if they're sketchers, they understand deep down the problem with this. They would say, oh, I would never do that, like any pious person would. But they're still, they understand the drive to want the popular people not to make fun of them. And even in class, people were kind of messing around sometimes. And I said, well, what about the time your parents put into allowing you to go to Ephesus school to learn so that you're known for your wisdom? You want to waste that time to clown around and try to get the other kids to like you. I said, this is the same thing. And I didn't mention any names at the time and didn't need to. Everyone understood what the point was, that this is how it works. And then towards the end of the chapter, when it talks about how Sodom and Samaria are going to look good in comparison to Judah, it was very easy to say, you know, when your younger sibling gets punished for something and then you go and do the same thing, you should have known better. You saw what happened to your sister. You saw what could have happened to you if you had done the same thing as your brother or whatever. And there are so many themes about being loyal, about being kind, about being respectful of what is given to you, the importance of gratitude. All those things are in that chapter and every kid can latch onto that. And with the image of the wife who wants to go and find boyfriends, which is how I put it in the class, that packs a punch. Because every child knows if their mom went 
and was looking for boyfriends, how devastating it would be to their family. Right. And they really understand that image. I mean, it really socks them in the gut. With the toddlers, I was pleasantly surprised by their reaction. Now, when you say toddlers, what age are you talking I about? I had four, five, six, seven. There's a range of comprehension right. there, but I'm talking even the younger kids, like the four-year-olds, really latched on to the metaphors in the story. They were very excited about this image of the bride as a princess. They all understood the value of the jewels and the adornments and all the gifts that were given to Israel by Israel's husband, who is, you know, God in the story. Uh -huh. The metaphor of abandonment, the image of abandonment, was actually very powerful. Oh, the baby abandoned? The baby abandoned. All of the kids understood it, and, and some of the kids in the class who may have actually experienced abandonment in their life really latched onto the story. Oh, yeah. And they were a captive audience. It was so devastating to these young kids to think about this child being left behind. I mean, they understand this problem because it's every child's fear. And so then they were very appreciative of God's generosity towards this child that had been uh, abandoned. Okay. And so it unfolded very well. And when we started talking about the betrayal component, there was one girl, she's like four years old, very enthusiastic, very outspoken, and very thoughtful, started explaining her relationships and her family and how her sisters treat her very well, but sometimes her brother picks on her. And she was trying to connect her brother's betrayal of her and uh -huh. their relationship <laughs> with the bride's betrayal of God in the story. Oh, okay. But to me, when someone that age is making any connection... Right with a story as complex as Ezekiel chapter 16. Uh -huh. It's amazing. It's encouraging. I was really happy. And it was very easy then to round out the story with the second part of the chapter, which deals with the consequences of their behavior and ultimately the shocking ending, which is like the story of the merciful father who accepts the uh -huh. prodigal son. Right, right, yeah. The shocking ending where after all this betrayal, which all the kids understood viscerally, he accepted his bride back. It's right. very powerful. Yeah, no, the image of your parents leaving you to go be with the Skechers, right. see how well the Skechers take care right. of you. That was a really powerful image, too. I mean, it's so beautiful, this literature. I mean, classic literature is stuff that you can read when you're 4 years old, when you're 10 years old, when you're 15 years old, when you're 20 years old, when you're 30 years old, and every time you see new depth to it and you make new connections. And to see that four-year-olds are already beginning to make connections with this text in such a deep way and yes. such a, you know on, on a gut level they really understand what's going on they understood the scandal of the betrayal without having to really deal with adultery or sexuality right so it was more about just being faithful and being appreciative and the, the problem of mm -hmm. betrayal how betrayal feels even that this young girl could identify her feeling of betrayal with mm -hmm. God's feeling of betrayal in the story right. is a correct understanding of scripture. Uh -huh. Adults tend to look at scripture and say God is being so abusive. Right. But the child understood that it was God who was being abused in the story, uh -huh. which is an important connection. I think that the children who could identify with the abandonment also latched on very strongly to the idea of God as the provider who fills the space oh. that human beings leave empty in your life, which is hopeful. Yeah. Which is hopeful. Yeah, no, and it, it was so good to be able to have the discussion of, like, what do you get worried about? And it was funny because a lot of the kids were like, oh, no, I'm not really worried, or, oh, I'm worried about getting my homework done. And, and I was like, right, but how about being embarrassed? Are you worried about being embarrassed? What do you do so you're not embarrassed with other people? What do you do so that the popular kids like you? You ever worried about the popular kids talking behind your back? Sure. You know, right. and talking, because I've got middle schoolers, you know, so that's every middle schooler's nightmare is that everyone's talking about them behind their back, you know? and As opposed to adulthood where hopefully you realize everyone talks about everyone and it really doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but the journey between middle school and that realization as an uh, adult is a very long journey. Yeah, I learned, I learned that I'm not important enough for people to talk about behind my back. They've right. got much more important people to talk about behind their back. Right. So. Well, I guess, actually, the lesson is uh, you can't control what people say anyway, so why worry about exactly, it? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I was really happy about that notion of betrayal because they actually taught me something about how to read this chapter is that for the adult, the shocking thing is the sexuality when the real shocking thing is the betrayal. Right. And the, the sexuality is only a mechanism for showing the betrayal. If your mother has a boyfriend, you don't have to know anything about sexuality to know that there's something amiss. And I'm talking about your mother who's married right. to your father. Your, your mother is married to your father and has some boyfriend. 
you know that there's something wrong. It's funny because even though we know the text is not about sexuality, it uses sexuality as a vehicle to convey its teaching. It's interesting that even in the way it does use sexuality as an example, right. the focus is not on sex, it's on how our behaviors make other people feel mm-hmm. or how they affect the people around right. us. You know, It's such a beautiful expression of... Why do we have all these things with us? You know, I emphasize this. Now, why is she so beautiful? Why is she so beautiful? Because God allowed her to live, first of all. She's not dead. But secondly, giving her all the makeup and all the jewels and the beautiful clothing and the crown and all this, this was all given to her. So that's why she's beautiful. And it's so easy for us We want to personalize things, and we're individualistic as Americans. We want to say, this is mine. It's been given to me. God can't take it back. That debate actually came up with the toddlers. Yeah. That was interesting. And again, it proves the point that if you give children the respect they are due as human beings, if you give respect to their capacity to comprehend and to learn, I think you're always surprised at what Uh happens when you don't impose limits as a teacher and the kids felt that tension in the story and a debate not prompted by me took place in the class oh, really? with toddlers again oh yeah what do they say no but this is my notebook my mama gave this to me right in terms of all the uh-huh. gifts that god gave the the bride right. this is my notebook this is my dress is it your dress i mean we had the discussion there was a little bit of back and forth they yielded in the end but in those uh-huh. situations the adult has the upper hand right right but again the fact that the question was raised about the ownership of their clothes the ownership of their toys uh-huh. is a tremendous victory for their education right and no. their growth as human beings Yeah, and it's interesting because this chapter is so beautiful in the way that it understands the psychology of the human being, that the human being, when he or she comes into possession of something, the fact of owning it becomes more important than the fact of its origin. And this is what, and all the prophets, this is what God is trying to express, that I gave this to you, I gave this to you, I gave this to you, not to use it for this reason, but to use it for a greater purpose, which is for being kind and being just and loving the neighbor. Recently in reading the Book of the Twelve on my own and in looking at that, it's amazing. Every book, except one so far, critiques sacrifice. But why does it critique sacrifice? Because you weren't given the sacrifice. You could perform sacrifices. You were given sacrifices as an acknowledgement of the gifts that God gave you. In Joel, God explicitly takes away what he gave you so that you don't have any grain or any wine for a sacrifice. And then when God leaves a little bit, it's a blessing because you have enough to do the sacrifice. And that's what the people in Joel finally understand. It goes back to last week's discussion where we touched a bit on this, a function. Nothing is intrinsically good or intrinsically evil. Right. Such an essential concept to grasp. Once you realize this, you can begin to assess an action's functional value and context, as we Uh said. And the tendency of religious communities, which is why I think that this is such a strong critique in the prophetic tradition, is to take a religious practice and decide that it's good. And then to move forward like you're pushing a lawnmower, mowing everything under Uh that gets in the way of doing this action. And when your sacrifice results in the mowing under of the weaker brother, scripturally, you're in a danger zone. It's a very serious problem. And this is why Israel fell into their problem, because they thought they could use their stuff on whatever they wanted. And they tried to court the favor of the other gods and the other nations. I mean, there's two reasons why. They court the other gods for the sake of their wealth, which is agricultural at this time, and the other nations for their military security. That's Correct. what they're trying to do. Basic it's always it's always the two things. that God is always going to attack by famine and by war. And so they're going and hedging their bets just in case God doesn't pull through. And this is the sin of humanity and of Israel in the Bible of hedging your bets. Well, look, if this week we've started our students, our younger students and our adult students, if we've started to get our community in the habit of always checking their behavior against the story and examining their conscience against the biblical story, and if we've taken our first steps towards looking to Ezekiel to help with that self-examination, then hopefully we're starting down a path where we're not intent upon what we determine to be good and enforcing that. We become more intent upon how our behavior needs to be corrected today and where to go to seek that examination when we're unsure about our behavior. And I think reading Ezekiel to children is a great start. Yeah, I know. It worked really well. So thanks a lot for your time this week, Richard. It was a good discussion. Yeah, thank you, Father.
You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening.